Welcome back to History on a Hog. I'm Captain Boss. I've been investigating the mysterious aircraft disappearance of the White Bird in 1927. It was the only European airplane entry for the Ortega Prize, which was being offered to the first aircraft to successfully transit the Atlantic nonstop from Paris to New York. In part three, we took a look at the other aircraft teams that were competing against the White Bird in this great transatlantic aviation race. If you recall, the first to make the attempt was the French pilot René Fonck with a Sikorsky trimotor aircraft in September of 1926. Hopelessly overloaded, it crashed and burned during the takeoff attempt killing two of the four airmen on board. They were now out of the race. In April of 1927, the other aircraft teams assembled and prepared for their attempts, but all would suffer mishaps and major setbacks along the way, with the noted exception of Charles Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis team. The team consisting of Chamberlain and Acosta undertook a series of test flights with their Polanka aircraft, Columbia. However, the crew was confrontational and it was apparent they did not get along well, resulting in Acosta leaving the team for the rival America team. Acosta's replacement, Lloyd Bertout, would later take several legal actions over several contract disputes. Ultimately, a court injunction was imposed to prevent Columbia from making the transatlantic attempt without him. It would never compete for the Ortega Prize, and they were out of the race. Navy Commander Richard Byrd's America team were also making preparations and test flights with their Fokker trimotor. In addition, his financial backer, Rodman Wanamaker, had New York's Roosevelt Field improved and significantly lengthened because of what had happened to Fonk's Sikorsky aircraft crash nine months prior. Meanwhile, Byrd had a large ramp built for America to roll down on takeoff, providing extra speed for its takeoff. However, on April 8th, Byrd's team in America crashed following a test flight during a routine landing attempt, seriously damaging the aircraft. His pilot, Floyd Bennett, was seriously injured in the crash and would be unable to continue. The America team was done. It would never compete for the Ortega Prize. And later that month, on April 26th, a test flight by the team of Davis and Worcester in the American Legion would end tragically. While flight testing with a heavy load of fuel, the overloaded aircraft was barely able to get off the ground. It climbed slowly, and at only a few hundred feet in the air, it was apparent it could no longer climb. It is suspected they stalled the aircraft and lost altitude, crashing nose down into a Virginia swamp, killing both men and ending their attempt. Obviously, they would no longer compete for the Ortega Prize. Again, this was just another example of an early aviation multi-engine aircraft design that was way overweight for the severely underpowered engines to overcome. They simply could not get off the ground due to the lack of engine thrust available in these early aircraft engine designs. These aircraft simply needed to carry too much fuel in order to make the flight non-stop. So it made them extremely heavy and this usually resulted in tragic consequences. Engine propulsion technology just wasn't there yet. Aviation was having to learn these lessons the hard way, in blood. Meanwhile, Lindbergh's team was just a few weeks away in making their own attempt. So what about Nungesser Coley and the White Bird? Even as Lindbergh was gearing up to make his record-setting flight, the two Frenchmen were already several steps ahead of him. By May 8th, Nungesser and Coley 
had heard of the failures of the Americans, and they were ready to make their attempt to win the race and the Ortigue Prize for the glory of France. The morning of their takeoff at Le Bourget Field, where Lindbergh would eventually land nearly two weeks later, a crowd of reporters, spectators, and celebrities, including Josephine Baker and Maurice Chevalier, gathered outside in the early morning air. Ambulance sat parked along the runway, as most new airplanes of the time usually crashed on takeoff. The pilots climbed into the plane wearing electrically heated leather flying suits. Something new for the time. Nungesse stood smiling and waving to the crowd and blurted out, We leave here broke, risking our lives, he said. If the Americans want my passport, I'll turn back. The White Bird started down the runway at 5.17 a.m. It lumbered forward, building up speed for nearly half a mile. Then the plane slowly lifted off the ground and climbed steadily into the air. The crowd went wild. As planned, the pilots jettisoned the wheels and landing gear to reduce the weight in a nearby canal. Escort planes then followed the White Bird to the French coast and then watched it as it disappeared into the overcast morning sky. The plotted route would take the plane northwest over England and Ireland, and then it would turn west to fly over the featureless North Atlantic Ocean. They were planning on crossing the ocean in roughly 22 hours, and then hoped to see the shoreline of Newfoundland, Canada. Here they would make a course correction southward and head towards Nova Scotia, then on to Cape Cod, and to Long Island before ultimately reaching their destination of Roosevelt Field and the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. The flight from takeoff to touchdown was expected to take roughly 40 hours. At approximately 7.15 a.m., a British submarine noted the plane over England. A few hours later, it was spotted off the cliffs of Ireland. A French newspaper erroneously reported the next day that the duo had successfully landed. But the White Bird never arrived in New York. Newspapers all over the world ran the headline, Where is Le Sol Blanc? It had obviously crashed, but where? The leading theory of the newspapers of the day suggested that the flimsy aircraft had been forced down somewhere in the Atlantic during a reported ocean storm during the night. The governments of Canada United States and France quickly mobilized an ocean search, but after many days and nights of searching by each nation's coast guard, no wreckage was ever found. A week later, active searches for the aircraft were suspended, their disappearance listed as a mystery. Another theory has suggested that the flyers were mistakenly shot down by the U.S. Coast Guard thinking the plane could have been a possible rum runner or smuggler. Remember, the United States was in the grips of the prohibition during this time, and the Coast Guard was tasked to enforce the booze embargo at sea. Happily, this theory has been debunked and has no basis in fact. As the weeks passed with no trace of them, the fate of the aircraft and crew soon faded into history and forgotten. Lindbergh's successful flight three weeks later captured all the newspaper headlines and all but erased the memory of the White Bird and her crew. But in the decades since, additional theories have surfaced based upon several interesting tidbits of information that have trickled down over the years in both southern Newfoundland and down east Maine. Astonishingly, over the years since the disappearance, several inquiries by reporters and authors revealed that there were many eyewitnesses from both Newfoundland and Down East Maine who claimed that in the early morning of May 9, 1927, they had heard some strange noises in the sky. Today we would describe these noises as aircraft engine noise. 
And some of those eyewitnesses even claim they had heard crash sounds. Remember, in 1927, airplanes were still very new, and few people, especially in these northern latitudes, had ever seen or heard one before. In any case, these eyewitnesses stated it had been a very foggy morning on that particular day, following a night of severe thunderstorms, and the visibility was very poor. They also admitted that they actually never saw the aircraft. They only heard one, or what they thought was one. But these reports suggest that the White Bird may have crashed in either one of these two North American locations, either Newfoundland or Down East Maine. When you come back for part five, I'll hit the road and ride up to Down East Maine and look into the claim that the White Bird may have crashed near the U.S.-Canadian border. And I'll take a hike up to the suspected crash location. Find out what I discover next time on History on a Hawk.